All right. So where we left off, what I was getting at before, is that we had the little book bag of poker chips that I put away. And we had gone through the different ways that we could we want to calculate the probability of each one after we had drawn some I believe it was blue, red, blue, for example. So we observed these and we want to know which one of the five scenarios it was. Four red, three red, two red, one red, and then the rest being blue. So either one blue, two blue, three blue, or four blues. And we want to know which one of the ways it was. Which one it was and with, with what probability. How confident would we be in each one of these being the case? After we pulled one out, saw the blue, put it back in, shuffled up the bag, pulled out another one, and repeated. And what we had said was that the number of ways we had done the whole branching tree thing, right, where we drew out all the different possibilities, where, for example, for the one blue, three reds, it looked like this. We had the three, and then it branched out again. So this was for the first draw. Which one was it? Well, it turned out to be blue. So all of these were invalid branches. But out of this one, it could be one of the three reds or the blue. And then for the second draw, you know, it was red. So now these three were still valid. And we branched out again. Since once again, there's one blue and three red. These were the four possibilities that we could have gone. And then we saw that, okay, it was either blue or red, two, three, one, two, three. So in all, to see blue, red, blue, it was one of these three paths that we had gone down. And then the blue right here. So in all, we found there, for the number of ways to get this blue, red, blue, were three in this case, right? And we had said that in total, there were 64 ways because there was four for the, each one spread out to four. So four by four is 16 right here. And then again, by four, each one of these 16 go by four. Therefore you get 16 times four, well, four 16 times, and that's gonna be your 64, right? And so out of the 64 branches, three of them were consistent with the data and compatible with the data. And we went through and did it for the other ones where what we did was we started to do the shortcut of math saying that for the first draw, there are two ways here. And then for the second draw, there are two. And then the third way, there is two. So it was two by two by two, which gave us eight. And for this one, there's three. Uh, there's one way, uh, then three. I'm sorry. No. If there were three blues and then a red, therefore, to get the blue, there are three ways for the first one. And for the second draw, each one of these, there was only one way. And for the last one, for each one of them, there are three ways. So it's three by one by three, right? Three ways to get the blue, then one way to get the, set, the the red, and then three ways to get the second blue. So three times two, one times three gives us nine. Three, one, three. And then for both of these, it was zero. Now, one thing that we could also do, of course, is write these as probabilities. And the way to do that is to just say that, well, out of the 64 total ways that I could have drawn it, right? There are 64 different possible draws in the case of the one blue and three reds. And out of those 64, three of them would have been this. And so there was a three out of 64 chance of having gotten that, right? So we could have, if we wanted to, now there's no need to do this, but we could have written this all in probabilities, right? This one had a three out of 64 chance of occurring. If it was this bag, we had an 8 out of 64 chance of seeing this data. If it was this bag, it would have been a 9 out of 64 chance of seeing this data. That's all we were saying. Similarly, we didn't talk about the prior ways. And what we had originally written was all 1s here, meaning that, well, what I had done was that I believe I had taken five different stacks of the poker chips. This is what I actually did do. And I closed my eyes and I Switch them around and I put one in the bag and I close it up and then I didn't look at what which ones were left by, you know, by just spreading them out and everything. So I couldn't easily tell. And so what we said was that each one of them were equally likely. And so ahead of time, we said there was one way that each one could have been put in the bag. Right. 
And then all that we said was then we multiplied the number of ways, and that gave us our final answer, right? Which, well, we then had to normalize afterwards or sum it up to one in order to get probabilities. But at least if we just took the number of ways, if I back this up without the probabilities for one second, right? This is all just review. Then we got our final answer, which was the posterior, I called it, which was the total number of ways, including with our prior here, which gave us 0, 3, 8, 9, 1. And then I said, well, to actually get the, this does tell us the relative likelihood for each one of these different bags. But to actually get the probability, oh, uh, we have to take the sum and divide by that. So that way, our probabilities sum up to 1. And so in this case, that's 20. So we had to divide by 20. All right. Now, to connect this with the math we're about to go over, I want to quickly go back to showing these with probabilities here just really fast. And I'll show you how all of these connect. And so here for the prior, you know, this is once again out of the total number of, of different paths, how many it was. And then for the prior, the way that we can also think about it is that what's the pr probability that the one in the bag is actually that one? Well, since there were five stacks and I put one in at random, there's a one out of five chance that it could have been. All right, so I could, so if I wanted to, I could write it like this. And now when I multiply it together, just really fast, we'll see, for the record, this is not, this is not already normalized, right? This is still just zero. This one, each one of these, you have to take one fifth times 364, well, 64 times five is, 320, so we get 3 over 320, 8 over 320, 9 over 320, and 0 again. And still with this, we're going to have to take the sum of it, divide by the sum, and of course the sum of this is going to be 20 over 320, therefore we have to divide by, you know, we have to take this and somehow divide by the 320 over 20, and then of course you see the 320s cancel, we get the 3 over 20. So that's so it comes out to be the same thing if we include these or not. And so lots of times when we're doing our math, whenever you, and we don't, luckily don't do the math by hand too much, frequently people will leave off the probabilities here and just leave off these 64s and the 5s, keep them at these unnormalized numbers, and then just normalize at the very end because it just makes the math easier and we don't have to think as much. But I want to show you this because this shows right here the number of ways to have gotten blue, red, blue, right? Or the probability of it. The way that we could rewrite this, we want to write this mathematically, is that this right here is the probability of having gotten uh, blue, red, blue, given that the true bag is all red, right? This is just saying, what's the probability of the data that we saw given that this was the bag, given our hypothesis of the bag, all right? Or given the state of the world is this. And similarly, we can go down the line here. You know, this one is what's the probability of having gotten blue, red, blue, conditional on, given that the bag is actually too blue and too red, all right? And so all that we're saying in this one is, how consistent is the data with this version of the world, right? With this bag. And over here, this is clearly the probability ahead of time. We could write this one as, the probability of before we, of the four reds before we even saw any data, what was our probability on the four reds? And in this case, we said, well, it's one out of five, right? So we could fill it all in just like this. And in general, what this says, right? Now, when we multiply these two together, what this says is now it's not the probability afterwards, right? We want to know, we want to know what's the probability of some given bag, given our observations, given our data, 
right? And it's not quite equal to this, right? But it is proportional to, proportional to, because we're still going to have to normalize, but proportional to the probability of the data given our bag times the probability of the bag. That's all it is. Now, to get this actually into probability, to make it be equal, this is where I was saying, where we have to do a little bit of trick, trickery here, and it's not hard. All we have to do is divide by the sum of this value, this multiplication, right? Because this is the, the way to view this. Is this is like the total ways for each one of the bags. But we have to sum up over all the different possible bags. And we have to say, what's the probability of data given bag I, you know, bag, you know, the all red bag, the one bag, the one blue, two blue, three blue, or all blue bags, times the probability of that bag. Right? So all this is, the fancy thing down here is just the sum of all these, right? Because this one right here is the right number. And so to get the actual probability for this bag right here, or just so that way it's not zero, we'll look at this one here. We have to first take these two and multiply it. And then we have to divide by the sum of all of these, which is just this times this, plus this times this, or this number, right? This times this, this times this, this times this. We have to sum up all of them. And there we go. All right. So in general, and what I was telling you with before is that if you take this, another way to write this is since we're summing up over all the possible bags, that this is just equal to the probability of the data. And of course, this is what we always knew we had to do from the very beginning because this is just base rule, right? Probability of bag given data, if you want to reverse it, you reverse it, multiply by probability of bag, divide by B, right? Remember, we wrote this right in the very beginning of class, probability of A given B is equal to probability of B given A, probability of A, all over probability of B, right? And this matches perfectly, right? So it turns out when we're just counting the number of ways and then normalizing it so that way it sums up to one, we're actually doing Bayes rule. We're doing the same thing. And so we frequently will just do it with the math instead of doing and counting up with a table, okay? So now, what we were talking, so now to actually move on to the topic at hand, what we wanted to talk about was about flipping a coin. And this is not quite as easy as the bag, because the bag, there was only five possibilities. But with the coin, there's a lot of different possibilities, right? You know, the coin could be biased in terms of having a 50%, and it could just be a true fair coin of 50-50. Or it could be that it's 60-40. Or it could be 61-39 in favor of flipping heads. Or it could be 69.11258 and whatever it is on the tail side. It could be any of those. So the problem comes into play is, well, okay, we can't just list out this huge table. So what do we do? Okay. So what we're going to do to the first at the very start of this is we're going to take it nice and easy and we're going to do what's called the grid approximation. And the grid approximation is nothing special. All it is is it says, well, treat it like it's a bag, right? And so in this case, we can keep it very simple and we can do the grid approximation with say five, where instead of considering all the different possibilities, we just limit ourselves to say five, which is, okay, the probability of heads, which I'm going to call theta here, Either theta is equal to zero, or it's equal to 0 0.25, which is a 25% chance of heads, or it's, say, a fair coin. Let me fix that up. Or it is biased in favor of heads. I forgot my theta there. Or it is actually like a double-headed coin, right, where it's 100% chance. So we just say, okay, imagine those are only five possibilities. All right. And now we 
tossed the coin a few times. And I told you it came up with two out of the three were heads. Right? I didn't give you any more information. I could have given you the direct order. And if I had, then this would literally reduce to exactly identically to the bag situation. Right? Where this one is, you can imagine that there's zero red. This one is one out of the four are red, two out of the four red, three out of the four red, four out of four red. And then we count the number of ways. And it's exactly the same. Where, in fact, I'll show you really fast. If I told you it was heads, tails, heads, all right, which would be just like with the red, blue, red, you would see that the probability of getting the data, we would say is just, oh, well, it's one out of four times three out of four, which is the probability of getting the heads the first time, if this was, if it was truly 25%, was one out of four chance. Here to get the tails, well, if it's 25% chance of heads, then it must be 75% chance of tails, so it's times three quarters. And then to get the last heads, it's another one out of four. And sure enough, here's three out of 64. So it would have been exactly the same. All right, and then you can see that because already it would be like if the bag had three, uh, three reds and a blue, well, there's a three out of four chance to pull out a red, one out of four chance of pulling a blue. So it's perfectly identical. All right? Uh, if I told you that it was heads, tails, heads. But instead, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, of a little bit of a twist, and we'll see it doesn't even matter, it turns out, by telling you instead that it's two heads and one tails. But I don't tell you the order. That's the only difference. All right? And we'll see that it doesn't, uh, in, in this case, it doesn't really matter. All right. So how do we do this? Well, now we still have to do the first step, which is, well, first of all, what's the probability of each of these? Well, we haven't even talked about it prior, but we will in a minute. All right. So for right now, we'll assume that we go into it saying, you know, totally naively thinking that each one is, you know, equally likely of being true. Even though, of course, if I had a true coin here, we would know, you know, a true coin that I picked up from a bank, we would say, oh, yeah, about 100% chance that it's this one. And then I put about zero on any of these. You know, maybe there's like a one in, in a million chance that I somehow went to the bank and happened to get a double-headed coin or something. You might even give these to be more likely than one of these because, you know, getting a loaded coin is probably pretty difficult if you let it hit the ground. Uh, so my bet is that it would probably either have to be for sure, zero, you know, double-headed, double-tailed. Or it would have to be about even, you know. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. So we come back to two heads and a tail. And the big thing is, you know, we're going to assume this one's one. This thing, we're just going to be doing a normalization afterwards. So that one's fine. Um, and then this one is uh, the only thing that we really have to calculate, which is what's the probability of getting two heads and a tail, given that we have a certain probability of theta. So I'm going to do it not for each one of them. We could easily do it for each one. It's not hard. I'm just going to do it in general just to make my life a little bit easier. All right. And so what we had started to say, and this was right at the end of the, of the last lecture, but I wanted to kind of go back over it and remind you of everything. Um, so we get two heads and one tails. And you want to know what's the probability of this data given our bag, which in this case is that theta is equal to some value. And I'm just going to, for the sake of this right now, I'm going to leave it just as theta. I'm not going to actually fill it in. So what is this probability? I'm actually going to move it over so that way I don't go to the edge of the board. So probability of two heads and one tails, given that we have and what we said was that the probability of this is not too hard to calculate. So the first part is, what's, uh, is that we can treat it just like what we did with the bag, right? Which would be that to get heads twice, we would have to do a theta, right? Because remember, theta is the probability of getting a heads times theta again. And then to get the tails, it would have to be one minus theta. Right, that's the probability, or if you want to think of it this way, the number of ways, you know, one out of four, three out of four, or what have you, right, of getting these values. And so in general, what we can actually write here is that we can 
write this a little bit more succinctly with a squared there. And in fact, a lot of times what people do is you do it like this. You can rewrite this a little bit here and say heads equals two, tails equals one. And then if you really want to, you can say, aha, this is just the number of heads I got, and this is the number of tails I got. Magic. All right. So that's pretty cool. But, and this is what we were starting to talk about right before the end of class, was that we have to account for the fact that I didn't tell you the order that they came in. So I didn't tell you this was heads, tails, heads. So technically, it could have also been heads, heads, tails, or it could have been tails, heads, heads. Could have been any one of those orders. All right? And so because of that, there's actually... For each one of these, there's this many ways, you know, so you can think of it as we got uh, three out of the uh, 64. Uh, yeah, three out of 64 or the nine out of 64, whichever one this is. Um, but there were three of them, actually. In fact, if you actually drew it out, you would see that, for example, if we had the bag where it was, you know, um, let's see if I can write this up. Oh, no, this pen's going. But if we had it be, for example, the three red and a blue, and we did the whole expansion again, if we did this expansion, but then I told you, ah, any one of the three orderings were okay, right? As long as it had two blues and a red, well, what would happen is there would be a lot more valid ones. Rather than having to go down blue, then red, then blue, Right, which would give us one, three, one. So that's three of them. Also, the red, blue, blue would have been okay, which would have given us three ways there and then one, one. So that's three more of them. And also, uh, blue, blue, red would have been okay, which would have let you go blue, blue, and then red, which gives you three more. So in all, you would have had nine, which is just as we expected. There's three of these different orderings. Each one of them specifically should have three. So that would be. In total, you get three times as many. All right. Now then, that's easy enough for three, but when I tell you that we tossed the coin eight times and five of them came in up heads, well, how many are there then? In general, what you end up writing is there's a formula for it, which is just the fact, which is just the combinatorics, which is eight choose five or whatever it is. And in general, uh, the rule of the, what you can do is you can just say it's going to be the number of times you threw it and the number of heads or tails. It actually doesn't matter. The formula will come out the same. And this is just equal to n factorial all over k factorial times n minus k factorial. It's not very, it's not very important for this class that you know this, but that's what it is. And part of the reason why it doesn't matter is something that we're going to see in just a moment. All right. It turns out this is a constant for all the different scenarios, and it all just cancels out. All right. But in general, we have a three choose two, so we have a three there. So for this, so this is the general formula for if you have the data of two heads and a tail. So let's quickly apply it to this. And now I'm going to do it just like we were doing with the um, instead of actually writing out the full equation like this and finding out each one one at a time. I'm going to show you how to do it kind of quickly by doing it. The same way like we were doing in the uh, for the bag problem, which is that we have to write out the probability, right? This is the, the scenario, right? So this is the scenario, I'll call it, where theta equals zero, or maybe I'll just, instead of saying scenario, I'll just say theta. That should make things easier. Here's theta, and it's either zero, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75 or 1, All right? And then we have to figure out the number of ways, which, as we were just discussing, is the probability of the data given the theta. And that formula is right here. And we can plug into it. And so this one's going to be 3 times uh, 0 squared, because we had two heads and one tails times one to the one. So just like with the bag, where we said that, okay, all red or all blue was wrong because we 
got one of each at least, at least one of each, same thing's happening here, as you'd expect, right? And then down here, of course, we get the one squared and then the zero to the one. And so that one's also gonna be zero. And then we have three times this, and then we just have uh, 0 0.25 squared, 0 0.75 to the one, 0 0.5 squared, 0 0.5 to the one, or there's three quarters chance of getting heads, and so you have 0 0.75 squared times 0 0.25 to the one. And then we have our probabilities, our priors, which I said that we were going to go with kind of the silly one, which is what's the probability of having uh, the theta. And then we said, OK, this one's all one fifth here. They're all equally likely. And you can see already how, just like I was saying at the end, since we're going to be having to normalize anyway, these fives don't really matter, nor do the threes. So they're going to end up going away, too. All right. And so finally, now, if we add, if we multiply these together, which we get probability of data given theta times probability of theta here. Now we get this and we just get the same thing with three fifths in front. So I'm just going to, for the sake of argument, I'm probably, well, I'll leave the three fifths in front just for a fact. All right. Even though we know that once we normalize to make everything sound to one, we're going to have to divide those out anyway. All right. So we have the three fifths there. And then we just have to deal with all this, this stuff right here. So this one's zero. This one's going to be, uh, well, we already were talking about this because the bag thing. So this is one fourth squared, which is one sixteenth times uh, three sixteenth. So that's going to be uh, th three fourths, I mean. So that's going to be three out of 64. This one will be eight out of 64. I'm not even going to look. I'm just doing this from memory. Nine out of 64, and then this one zero and zero. And so finally, once we actually get the normalized, right, which is going to be probability of data, given theta, probability of theta, divided by the probability of the data, which once again, remember, this is just the normalization factor. Once we do this, you know, once we normalize this, we're just going to get zero. 3 out of 20, 8 out of 20, 9 out of 20, and 0. And this right here is, of course, equal to, as we just said by Bayes' theorem, the probability of each theta given our data. So this is all we're doing, right? This is me just showing you through a very long and tedious path that we're doing the exact same thing as counting, right? Except now we're talking about all with probability. And it all works out exactly like we expect. So if we flipped two heads and a tails, then we think it's most likely to be out of these five choices, 75%. Now, when, where things get interesting is what if I expanded this instead of five of these, what if I had a thousand? Well, now we're talking about a little bit more math there. All right, and I'm not gonna do that on the board, don't worry. But what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna go on the computer and we're gonna do it there. Because luckily the computer makes cranking out these calculations fast and nice, all right? So let me head over there. All right. So now we're at the computer. And what I've done is we can ignore this. I have this blank Google Colab. Remember, in case you forgot, it's Google Colab. Google Colab. And this lets us do all of the math right online in just the web browser very nicely. So while well, you can do this all in standard Python, I've done. We're gonna we're gonna use num what's called numpy. Numpy as np and numpy just has a lot of um just has a lot of it's a library that lets you do a lot of calculation on a bunch of numbers at once, a lot of vectors and such. So that's what we're gonna be using numpy for. You can easily look it up. We're gonna only we're not gonna use it that heavily in the course, so you know you can just kind of follow along. So. The first thing we're going to do, and I'm going to do it just for the five here, just to show you that we end up with the same answer. All right. So the first thing we have to do is make our list of thetas. And so, of course, I could write it out 0, 0 0.25 and so forth. But I'm not going to. I'm going to use lin space. Uh, I think it's lin space. Yeah. 
And what you can do is you can say, okay, I want numbers that go from zero to one and I want five of them. And I think that you can even say like start and end. I got to make sure I have that right. Let me see. Uh, oh, if I run this, you have to sit, hit shift enter. You have to click on play to actually run it. And then once you do, let's see this one space. And then you can see right here, it says start, stop and num right here. And it defaults to 50 numbers, but we're going to say we start at one. We stop. I was going to say end. If, uh, sorry, we start at zero end at one and we're going to have five of them. And let's just quickly run this and see what it spits out. Um, oh, betas. Let's see here. It gives us exactly what we want. It'll, what lin space does is make them nice, evenly spaced numbers from zero to one. So just for the sake of argument here, let's suppose I did 11. Now it would be zero and then 0 0.1, 0 0.2, all the way up to one. There was 11 of them. Very nice. All right, but we're going to stick with one for right now. All right. So there's our thetas. And now what we need to do is we have to get the probability of theta given our thetas. All right. So for each one of them, each one of our thetas here, we need to calculate how likely is the data for it, all right? And we already said that, okay, in the case of two heads and one tails, all it is is going to be, uh, we can say, uh, what we call the likelihood, and I should actually give you the definition of this real fast on the board, because this is something that we're going to see over and over again. This formula right here, I was already starting to label them all, but I should actually label them very clearly here. So we said that the probability of our theta, given the data, was equal to probability of data, given theta, probability of theta, divided by probability of data. All right. Now, the formal names for these, I've already kind of introduced some of them, is that this right here, top this one we should probably know already this one i've definitely labeled many times the prior prior belief on the different values of theta before we ever saw any data over here this one is i think i've also used the term several times this is the posterior this is our belief after we've seen the data after we've seen it and conditioned on it conditional on the data What's the different likelihoods? What's the different probabilities for the thetas? This right here, the probability of the data given our theta, right? Given a specific theta, what's the probability of the data? That is called the likelihood. So you oftentimes see me just hear me say the likelihood of the data. And then finally, this one, this one's kind of the black sheep, because like I said, oftentimes it's just like, okay, that's the 20 here that we're normalizing over. But it actually has some importance, and we'll talk about this as we go forward in the class. But this one is the likelihood of the data before we've seen any of the data. And so the technical term for it, which a lot of people don't like, but I do actually, I think it's fine, is called prior predictive. Oftentimes you'll see people ignore it a lot of times, this term, when they're actually doing the math. But it's called the prior predictive because it's the predictive has to do with predicting the data. And then the prior is saying that's before we've seen anything. All right. Before we've conditioned on what we've actually observed. All right. So it's the prior predictive. Um, lots of times I just want to let you guys know this. So that way, uh, if I start doing it without thinking in the future, lots of times what people will do, because this is just the normalization factor and also at a lot of times this thing is really hard to calculate. You'd think it would be easier, easy, but once you're dealing with rather than five things, but an infinite number, this sum ends up becoming an integral and sometimes the integrals are impossible to do, except numerically. So what lots of people will say is that the probability of, the, of theta given the data, the posterior is proportional to the likelihood in the prior times the prior. All right. And they just say it's proportional to, and they know that this number down over here is a constant, all right? It's not a function of the theta or anything like that. So it's just some constant value that we're gonna have to do to, to get everything to sum up to one. So they just say proportional to, just like how 
we said, oh, the total number of ways is three, eight, and nine, you know, zero, three, eight, nine, uh, zero. And that's not probability technically, but it's proportional to the final probabilities. We just have to divide by some constant. And what we'll see is it's very important that you can write this because like I was saying, eventually it gets very hard to calculate this. And we can do tricks on the computer to actually get the, the actual numbers here without actually calculating it by exploiting the fact that it's just a constant. And that's something we won't be talking about until like week eight. All right, so anyway, back to the task at hand after that little detour. We're here with our likelihood, which is the probability of the data conditional on the theta. So what we have to do is we can just say what's very nice about um, What's very nice about NumPy is, like I was saying, we can say theta is times 2, and it acts on everything, right? So the 0 stayed 0, 0 0.25 became 0 0.5, 0 0.5 became 1, the 1 became a 2, etc. We can also say, I believe you have to do it like this is squared, right? So now the 0.25 squared becomes 1 16th, which is 0 0.0625, 1 half squared, one half times one half is one quarter. One times one is one. So you can do it that way. There's also a numpy np dot pow, I believe. Oh, power. I don't know. Um, first element raised to the powers of the second element. So you can also do that if you want. All right. But in this case, we're just going to be saying uh, does times two. All right, to the power squared times one minus theta, which also works. We'll just quickly show you this, which is the probability of tails. Sure enough, that works like a champ. So the first power. And then all this, you have to multiply it all by three. I'm going to do this kind of the painful way, and then I'll show you. We'll go through a couple iterations of this to make it much cleaner. All right. So now we run this and we can check out our likelihood. Uh, maybe I should call this likelihoods just to be consistent here. So we already know that this should be what? Uh, three times the three out of 64 and then three times, uh, sorry, we'll see. <laughs> Zero out of 64 times three. Three out of 64 times three. Eight out of 64 times three. And then, uh, and so forth. And let's just double check that. Let's see here. 8 out of 64 times 3 gives us 0 0.75, just like we expected. And 9 out of 64 times 3, because remember, we had the 3 there. Sure enough, 0 0.42, 1875. Cool. All right. So this is all working as expected. So we have our likelihoods. Now we also need to write out our priors. And that is just going to be, well, just a bunch of ones, right? And so in this case, what we can do is we can say np dot repeat, which all this does is just rep just repeat a number several times. So I think you got to say repeat. Um, let's see, I believe it's five comma one. Let's double check to make sure this is working because we want five ones. Or we're going to have five one-fifths if we want. Oh, no, I have that terribly wrong. I think I want the number one repeated five times. There we go. I thought that's what it should have been, but I couldn't quite read the documentation right there. You always make mistakes. And this is why you just go underneath and test out the code before you actually run it. And so here, let me just delete some of these. So now we have our priors. Now, if we wanted to, you know, I could technically make this one-fifth. There's no harm in doing that, right? Just to keep it formally the same. That way it's the true probability here, even though once again, we know that it will get divided out at the end. So now we have our priors. And now what we want is our posterior where we multiply it together. And usually what we can call this is something like the unstandardized uh, posterior is what oftentimes people might write this as. Because all it is is the posterior, but we know it doesn't sum up to one yet. And all that is is the likelihoods times the priors. And then finally, last but not least, the posterior, we, and let's just quickly double check this. I mean, we already know what it should be. 
Let's just make sure everything's looking good. Everything, well, I don't know. I don't know. We'll judge it once we actually do this last step here, right? It's the unstandardized posterior. Posterior. And then we have to divide it by whatever the sum of that is, right? And luckily, there's just np.sum that sums up a, a set of values. So if we want to sum this up, we just do np.sum, and it will sum up the entire list and give us a single number. So here we go. Let's sum that up. And now we have our posterior, or posteriors, whatever you want to call it. All right. And here it is. 15%, 40%, 45%, exactly what we said, because we're just doing the exact math just on the computer. All right, so that looks great. Now, one, one thing that we can also do now is we can import uh, matplotlib. Oh boy, I have to remember how to do this. Um, ah, good, luckily it's, worn, it, it's suggesting a, uh, it was suggesting there we go. That's a common way to import it. And what this is, this is a set of plotting routines in Python. All right. It's one of these things where you just plop it up at the top and you're good to go. And now what we can do is plot dot plot uh, posterior. And let's take a look at what it looks like. And there it is. Right. Here's our five values. Maybe I could, uh, I don't remember all the different commands here. Let's see if I do that. What's it do? There we go. The for the um now it doesn't quite label this here. Let me do this a little bit more. Let me say thetas, comma posterior with dots, and there we go. Now we can see at zero, there's a zero probability. For the 25%, you know, when theta is 25%, then it has like a 15% chance. At 50% it's up there at 40, 75% chance is at 45, and then at 100 percent chance is down at zero. All right, so now what's nice about this is that we can easily convert this for a more complex, uh, uh, for different number of heads and tails, right? So let's just quickly go in here and quickly change the numbers here. So what we can do is we can say, okay, let's see here. First, we'll say grid size or number of bags or however you want to view it as five. So we're making this a little bit more general. So now we currently have it for if there's only five, but what if we did it for 10? Let's take a look at it real fast. Oh, it crashed. And that's because right here, I forgot that we want to repeat. Oh, and it shouldn't be one fifth. It has to be one over grid size. And then how many times do we repeat it? We have it n times because it's of 10 times. Because now we have the numbers zero through, well, let's, let's make it 11 just for, the, just for our sake. Because if we have to remember that the theta is with 11 with zero, 1, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and so forth. So we have all 11 of those. And then the prior should be 1 11th 11 times in a row, right? So we have to do all that. So we do all that. It only takes a second. Now we can plot it, and voila, we already have it up for 11 cases now. Looks quite a bit cooler, doesn't it? You can actually start seeing a little curve when you start looking at it by eye. So we see that 0 is still 0, and at 1 is still 0, not a surprise. But now at around, what is that, 0. 0.7 should be, uh, it's now about 17, about, around like 17, 18%, it looks like. All right. And then, of course, right here at 0. 0.6, it's also about 17, 18%. Now, this shouldn't surprise us that these two are the highest. Why? Because out of three throws, we got two heads and a tails. So our best guess, intuitively, would be that two thirds of the time, two out of three times, it comes up heads. And what's that percent? Well, that's 66.6%, you know, repeated, which is right at kind of in between the two. So the maximum should be right around there. That should be our, mo our best guess. And sure enough, it is. Now, of course, it's not an option for us because we limit ourselves to only 11 different bags, but it makes sense. All right. Let's actually make it look cool. Let's do let's do a thousand let's do a hundred bags. Let's take a look at that. Once again, it goes almost instantly, and boom, there it is. And where's the peak? Once again, right around two thirds. It should be right at two thirds, right? But you see, it doesn't it doesn't it's not some nice clean thing. But that's what it looks like. If we had a hundred and one bags, that's what it would look like. 
And then if we did a thousand bags, possible bags, then it looks pretty clear there. If I get rid of this O, which made the point, it would be a nice little line, and voila. Now, it would be a pretty simple guess to say that, well, as we go off to infinity, it's going to end up looking like this. But of course, the problem is, is that as you go off to infinity, um, the actual probability of any given one of them is going to drop, gets smaller and smaller. Look at this. We started off with only five bags, where like the most likely was 45%. And we moved to 11, and suddenly the best one at 0.7 was only, what did I say, it was like 17.5% or so, 17, 18%. And now, by the time we're up to 1,001 bags, each individual bag is very unlikely. You know, I mean, there's a thousand different bags it could be. The odds of it being any given one is pretty low. Now, of course, some are more likely than others still. But even the most likely bag is sitting there at 0.18%. And so then it ends up happening is if you go, as you go off to infinity, you start having, you can't, you can't quite do this the same way. Because, of course, as we go off to infinity for the different possibilities, what's the probability that it's exactly 0.6? Well, it goes to zero because, you know, sure, it could be 0.6, but it could also be 0.6000000001, right? And, you know, or it could be 0.60002, you know, or so on and so forth. There's, so, there's an infinite number of possibilities. So the probability that's exactly a very specific value is always going to be zero. There's just no ways about, no two ways about it. So there ends up being a little bit more complication with it. But this is, this is the grid approximation. It's pretty good because you get something that's pretty smooth already. When you get to infinity, you have to start doing integrals instead. And so we'll save that for another day. But don't worry. At the end of the day, even when you solve this for the generic case of, uh, with an infinite number of thetas, you get this exact same shape. It looks exactly the same. It's just this number on the left here. You have to interpret it differently because it's not the specific probability of a specific value, but rather it has to be some sort of infinitesimal and the probability and the and the overall likelihood and blah blah blah. And so there's some stuff called the probability density function instead. And you have to integrate over it. It's nothing that big, but it gives you the same shape. And so this from this we can get all the most all the most useful stuff out of it. So let's go back and let's uh, do stuff a little let's start changing the other variable here, which is we started off by changing the grid size, but now let's change the heads and tails. So let's say that here we go. So let's. So I'm going to write this a little bit more generically, where we say uh, n tosses is equal to three, because that was our number of tosses, and then n heads was equal to two in our case. And so now I can replace this two with the number of heads. And we already said that number of tails. We can just actually calculate it right here. N tails is just equal to n tosses minus the number of heads. So here, this one now is n tails. And then finally, this 3, we unfortunately can't just stick it with 3. We have to do that, uh, that, uh, that coefficient thing, which I'll have to see. Hmm. I don't actually remember what it is in Python. Let's see here. Stat, uh, SciPy. Let me quickly Google it. When you don't remember, look at it. So let's do this uh, Python binomial coefficient. This is what it's called. There we go. SciPy special binomial. I knew that was the case. There we go. Um, oh, not what I wanted. All right, there we go. So SciPy special binomial. So SciPy is another... Um, it looks like they might have renamed it instead of binome to uh, just com. We'll give it a shot. We'll see how this goes. We'll try it out real fast and make sure it's working. So SciPy is another library. I keep introducing you one. So NumPy is for doing on lists on a lot of different or vectors of uh, numbers for doing operations. So that's like making the list here, repeating being able to divide and multiply, summing things up, things like that. Matplotlib is for making plots. And then SciPy is usually more for doing stuff that involves 
like math. So this is where you have like distributions, you have special functions, things of that nature, a lot of more stuff that's used in science, which is SciPy. And so with SciPy, let's quickly take a look at this. So if we say three choose two, we should get, oh, SciPy, oh, sorry. It doesn't know what it is, but I didn't actually run this where I said to import it and load it into memory. Because I forgot to run that. Now that I ran it, uh, it still doesn't like it. Because I think I have to say dot special or something like that. There we go. Something like that. I don't know. There we go. Now it comes out with three, as we expected. And now, just to be curious, what if it was eight choose five? There we go. 56. And that sounds right to me. I can do the math by hand if I wanted. In fact, here, let's do it. Let's say, uh, although I don't know, is factorial even a thing? Ooh. Good to know. Uh, let's see here. It's probably like np.fact. No, no, it's math.factorial. I don't remember. I haven't imported the math either. So you'd actually have to look up what the factorial is. I think it's, I think it's the math library, which just has kind of more standard math. Uh, factorial. Here we go. Let's see here. Factorial 5. There we go. So let's quickly take a look at it just to make sure it actually works with the math I said. Math.factorial of 3. And we got to put this all down here. Times math.factorial of 5. Or 8 minus 3 is the other way to think of it. Right? 8 minus 3, which is 5. And sure enough, it comes out to the same value. And you can already see immediately why it is that if I switch this to 5 and the formula, it still works out. Because now instead of having 3 and 5, we have 5 and then 8 minus 5, which is 3. Right? So all we've done is at the bottom, we've switched from 3 and 5 to 5 and 3. So it always comes out to be the same, as we expect. Because you can, you can imagine that if we just replace every heads with tails and every tails with heads, the number of ways should be the same. So anyway, we can go back up here. And we can just plop that in. Once again, though, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because every single likelihood gets multiplied by the same value because all of them all saw the same data. And so at the end, it's going to get knocked out once we standardize at the end anyway. You can scale everything up and it doesn't matter. But here we go. And tosses and heads or entails, whichever one you want. And there we go. So now I believe that takes care of it and I should still get the same answer, which looks good. But now let's start looking at a few of these. So let's suppose that we only had one toss and it came out by heads. What would this look like? Let's take a look. There it is. Interesting. So you'll notice that, you know, the odds of it being 0% chance of heads is zero now. But the one, it is not zero. It's decidedly not zero. And that's because, hey, so far all we've seen are heads. Right? And in fact, you can actually imagine, let's suppose that we did five tosses and all of them were heads. Take a look at that. Wow. Now, once again, now this assumes, which is kind of foolish here, right? in real life, if somebody took a coin out right, from the bank and flipped it five times and it came up heads five times, you're not going to go, oh, yeah, I think it's pretty likely that it's really a double-headed coin. You know? And that's because our prior belief, when we see someone take it out of the bank, is not that every single one is equally likely. We don't think that, all right? We've seen enough coins in our day coming from the banks that we don't think that that's very likely. But if we act as a very naive person, we might, this is actually the, what we should actually be thinking, all right? And now let's take a look at it. So let's say that we did eight tosses and five of them were heads. Now let's take a look at it. Wow. So. What's interesting about this is that once again, that the max of it is going to be at five eighths, right? Which comes out to be what is that, sixty-two and a half percent? Sorry, so right here the max should be at 0.625 for the probability should have the highest likelihood, the highest posterior. I mean, all right, and then you can see it spreads out some. Now, what's interesting about this is that you don't have to do any calculations for standard deviation or anything like that. Let's watch when we do 80 and 50. What do you think it's going to be? Suppose that now it's still, we still expect it to be, if we throw 80 tosses and 50 of them are heads, we still expect the max to be at the same space of 62.5% because 
you know, seen five eight five out of eight tosses, best guess is six two and a half. But seen fifty out of eighty, still sixty two and a half percent would be our best guess. But what's it going to do to this? That's the question. And it's actually kind of neat because what it's going to do is let's think about this. The priors stay the same, but the likelihood is going to change them right here. This uh, this this part right here. It's going to change them. And let's quickly run it and then explain. So what happened was now it's still centered on that, but you see it's much tighter. The distribution's gone much tighter. It's much more certain that it's closer to 0. 0.6. While before, yeah, you know, even things at 0. 0.4 and 0. 0.3, yeah, it's possible. Or 0. 0.8, yeah, it's possible. But now those things have gone to almost, almost for sure not the case. And you think about it, if we go all the way up to, say, a thousand, 8,000 throws. Oh, that's a disaster. Uh, maybe I won't go quite that high. Uh, maybe it was still running. That might have been it. It might have still been running. I'm not sure. <laughs> have look, but let's just do it for the shorter one of 800 and, uh, and 500 there. And we see right here, it's just it's starting to get very peaky. All right? And so automatically, Bayes' rule and Bayesian inference here, just a number of ways, ends up canceling out and saying, the more data I have, the more sure I am it really is close to that. And the reason why is because you can think about it just logically. If you tossed a coin 8,000 times or 800 times, and I said 500 of them were head, that, that's pretty hard to imagine that the coin is really fair or unlikely to be heads. But if we roll back to saying eight and five, you know, well, yeah, you know, it's probably not, it's probably not biased against heads, you know, because five out of the eight came up heads, but it's possible. We could have just by chance gotten it. And Bayes will automatically take care of that uncertainty. Where we're sitting there going, well, with very little data, it's hard to say, right? It could be a lot of these things. But as you get more and more data, these things that are away from the peak, just it's just much harder to explain the data with them, right? The data just becomes hard to accept and explain with these things that are far away from the 0.625 as after we've thrown 800 times. Right? You have to be pretty close to really do a good job of explaining the data. And so we start seeing it start peaking right there and getting pretty tight. So that's pretty cool. All of our uncertainty and stuff is handled automatically. All right. With this, and this, and keep in mind now, just remember, this is a grid thing where I'm actually having a thousand points on there. I'm just connecting them all with lines. So now let's do one last thing before we uh, call it a day on this. All right. And let's start changing around our priors, all right? So right, originally we said everything was equally likely. So let's take a look at this, all right? That's great. Now let's try changing this some. Suppose I told you, and now this is a very simple thing. Now it's a slightly a weird prior graph, but what if I told you, I know for sure that this coin does not favor tails. I know a hundred percent chance here. Guarantee you that if it's that is not below 0.5, the probability of heads is at least 50%. I know it for sure. So what I have to do is I have to multiply my prior. I have to change my prior to be zero for everything below 50.5, and then above 0.5. It's just going to be flat because those I didn't give you any indication that one is more likely than the other. They're all equally likely above 50%, but we know for sure it's not below 50%. Now, one way that we can do this is it's going to be a little bit tricky here, but we can say thetas less than 0.5, uh, let's say greater than 0.5. And what you'll see this does is going to list out all, let me reduce this down to maybe just 11 again, just so that way you can see. Right, so here are our, uh, maybe I'll say greater than or equal to 0.5 here in this specific case. If you remember our thetas here, were zero in the case of 11, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and so forth. So what we wanna say is that all of these have a probability, prior probability of zero, 
and these something where they're all equal. And so what you can do is you can just say theta is greater than or equal 0.5, and what it does is it automatically says, okay, well, 0 isn't greater than 0.5, so that's false. 0.1 isn't, so that's false, and so on and so forth. Until right here, this is 0.4. That's also not greater than or equal to 0.5, so that's false. And now for the rest of these, they're all true. Right? And what's cool about that is that uh, NumPy will automatically, behind the scenes, if you try to multiply this by a number, like 1, it'll reinterpret these falses as zeros and the trues as 1. So when you do that, voila. Now our prior is 0 for everything below 0.5 and 1 for everything above. Now technically we should, you know, we could normalize it, but I'm not even going to bother to do that. I'm not going to like divide by the sum. I could. It's easy enough to say this is my prior and then normalize the prior so that way it sums up to 1. But we can have it be an improper prior and that's fine. We know at the end of the day we're going to be normalizing at the very end. So here, let's quickly replace that. So let me comment that out. And then we'll just plop that in there. Where we take all the thetas, see which ones are greater than 0.5, and multiply that by 1. Now, what do you think we're going to get? Well, it's nothing that big because all it does is, oh, it looks a little bit awkward with the only 11 points. Let's bump this up to 1,000. And that's what it looks like. It looks kind of nifty. But it's exactly what you expect because all of these were all equally likely. So it's not like we suddenly made some of them more likely than others. The maximum is still at 0.625, exactly like before. All that we've done is our prior just zeroed out everything below it. That's all we've done. It's nothing special. All right. But it's kind of cool. All right. But we can do all sorts of different shapes. Now, th this is not a, a normal shape. You would have a hard time writing a nice formula without having to use a piece. You'll have to use a piecewise if you wanted to write out the formula for this. But what we'll show as we go on is how do you actually take this and then actually communicate this value, you know, this distribution to people and stuff. So we'll talk about that in the next chapter. But I just want to do a couple more small tweaks with this, and then we'll call it a day. So let's look at a few other different uh, priors I could have. So one thing I could have, which I think is a fairly reasonable prior here, is we could have something that is like a normal distribution, which is a, um, which we can just say thetas. Let's see here. I think it's going to be np.exp. You'll have to learn your formula for a normal distribution at some point. But it's okay. For right now, I'll just write it out myself here. Theta is minus 0. 0.5 squared. Uh, and then let's have the theta be, I don't know, I'm just going to make something up here. Um, I'll just save one. We'll just leave it by itself. Let's, take, let's quickly plot this before I do anything. So plot dot plot. And we'll take a look at this prior. So this is the prior I kind of plotted out there, which is far too much. So let me quickly do five. Let's see here. Oh dear. Oh, I need to do times. So this is just the formula for a normal distribution. It's not going to sum up to one as it is, but that's okay. Let's do a uh, hundred here. So maybe this is a little bit more reasonable. And let me. Uh, I'll show you a few examples with this because it's going to be amazing to you guys just how much this just works. <laughs> it's amazing how much it just works. So here, this is like saying, you know what? I've seen enough coins in my day. You should hand me a random coin. I think it's between, you know, it's going to be pretty close to 50%, right? I'll give a little bit of leeway. Maybe it's a little bit biased in one way or another, but I'm pretty sure it's around 50, right? So this all gets a reasonably high probability, and these get all pretty much zero, right? And this is our prior. Let's say this is kind of our skeptical prior, where we, or alternatively naive, or, or maybe uh, something like, okay, informed prior, right? We know what coins look like. So now, suppose I do this, and now I say, okay, let's toss it eight times, and it comes our heads five times. How much is that going to move our prior, do you think, right? That's the question. And that is not at all what I wanted. Let me take a look at this. Oh, I should have named it priors. I'm sorry. 
There we go. It looks pretty much the same. And what we can do, and what you'll probably, and what you'll have to do for your homework is overlay the posterior and the prior, and you can see how much it moves. And you're going to see it's not going to move at all. What if I tossed it 800 times? Well, it depends on how strong this prior really is. It was a pretty strong prior, but let's keep an eye on it here. Maybe here, maybe I'll plot it underneath just so that way you might be able to see the difference here. Aha, uh -huh, look at that. With this one, with enough data, with 800 tosses and 500 heads, you can see it's actually moved over a little bit. You know, rather than thinking it's 50-50, with that much data showing it's not, you can actually lean a little bit more towards maybe like 58, 59% there. That's what ends up happening. Your prior is anchoring it, but the data can overwhelm the prior if you have enough of it, right? That's what the, that's what the data does. So what you have to do is somehow the data and mul and the likelihood, the data and sorry the data and the prior are multiplying together, and you have to weight the two together. Now what's interesting is what if we had? Let me show you this one. Now this one's going to be interesting. What if we had a hundred tosses and a hundred heads? Right now you and I personally would sit there and go. Well, if I threw it 100 times and it came ahead every single time, I'm not thinking it's close to 50-50. I'm not thinking it's 60%, right? Now, why is that? You know, this prior seemed like something that was reasonable. And yet then it gives us some totally insane result at the end of the day when we see 100 tosses and 100 heads, right? I mean, this, is, this just looks wrong. And the reason why was that our prior was too strong in a specific way which is that we had this prior and what it said was, okay, look, I know coins, this one's somewhere between 0.4 and 0.6. And I say anything beyond that is very, very unlikely. But in reality, probably our head is thinking a little bit differently. Our head's probably thinking something like this. Oh, oops. Um, yeah, you know what? I've seen enough coins. And if this is really just like a normal coin, right, then I think that this is what it looks like, right? And I think there's a, let's say, a 99% chance that it is just a normal coin. But there's this 1% chance that uh, it's just anything, right? Maybe this, guy is, maybe this guy has gotten a double-headed coin, or maybe he's cheating me, or whatever it is, right? You think maybe... This this one percent chance it's anything so what you can do is you can actually make a prior that says okay oops i meant this 0 0.99 99 percent of the time it's going to be in this range right and then yeah technically these are possible but very 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 unlikely but there's one percent of the time in which we just it could just be a uniform or it could be anything right and we can do that now it looks almost the same but everything here now has all been lifted up just a smidge, just 1%. And now what happens if we use this for our prior? All right, so it's the same thing, except I've just lifted everything up by a smidge. And now we see 100 heads. Now what's it say? Wow, look at that. Because what it's done is that, look, if this was really correct and it really was just a normal coin, then the odds of seeing 100 heads in a row out of 100 it's pretty much zero, right? So this 99%, you can think of it as we could even, we can, in fact, maybe later in the class, we can actually sit there and say that essentially, I came in thinking a 99% chance it's some normal coin and a 1% chance of it being something funky. But after seeing 100 heads in a row, I now know it was something funky. And so now you're like, okay, ditch that thing. This is definitely one of the funky coins. And my get best guess for this funky coin, it's a double-headed coin. And so just that little bit will make a difference. And in fact, this is something called Cromwell's rule, which um, something that to kind of keep in mind, which is a fun little thing from a uh, uh, in probability, which is that Cromwell was some kind of a weird kind of British pseudo dictator type thing. You know, but at one point he was, uh, he quoted, this is a very famous quote of his, which is, I beseech you in the bowels of Christ, think it possible that you may be mistaken. 
And the thing was that when we came into this prior, we pretty much were like certain before we had this point one one, we were pretty much certain of it that it was between there. And when you got the data, once after the output, it came out with a kind of un, unreasonable thing. And what Farmer's rule says is, well, keep in mind that you could be wrong, <laughs> right? And this is a way. This is one way. Usually, you don't have to do this. Usually, you just keep a little bit wider priors, which I'll show you in a moment here. But this is one way right here of saying, maybe I'm wrong and it could be anything, right? The other way we could do it is we could have just loosened up our priors here and said, okay, even if it was like this, you would see that uh, just a little bit wider with 100 instead of 1,000. You would probably even there see it dominate uh, on the right-hand side. You can see it's a little bit different shape, but now it says one's okay. And that's even though right here it looks like it's almost zero, even that almost zero ends up jumping up towards 100% because it just explains the data that much better. And so as long as you have even somewhat reasonable priors, as long as you aren't just super certain about things set in your ways, you know, if you're set in your ways, the data is not going to change anything. We see this all the time in real life. Some people walk in saying, I know exactly what it is. You show them data and they go, I still believe what I believe. Right. And that's what we were doing when we had it be ultra precise. But now if we just give the person, let's let, let the machinery say, okay, we give it a, a certain possibility of different things, right? Even if we think it's very unlikely, as long as we give it some probability, some reasonable amount, by the time we get enough data, it'll, it'll, it'll spit us over there. All right. And that's pretty cool. If we actually wanted to do it with the uh, thousand, you would have to get a lot of data to really convince you. Uh, oh, there we go. At least 10,000 does it with it. Let's see, does 1,000 do it? Even 1,000 does it, but 100 just wasn't enough. So even there, you see, even when we're pretty darn certain, uh, with enough data, we would have actually moved it eventually. All right, but we could make it much easier and much more reasonable. With 100 now, we're at around 80%, which still isn't a good answer. You know, 500 in a row, you know it's, you know it's not that, right? And so there we go. All right. But if we just add in a little bit more doubt by either decreasing our certainty in the shape of it or by giving ourselves the possibility of being wrong and saying that maybe there's a little bit of uniform possibility there, we would have broken out of this much faster. And in fact, we even see like even with something like that with a 10, we actually break out of it even faster. What's really neat about look at that. That looks pretty cool. Uh, let me show you this. So. So this is actually one little thing, a little bit going over, but that's okay. If we were really certain about it, right? This is with the 1,000 here. And then we add in the 0.01. We can see exactly what's going on here. What it's saying is that with just 10 tosses coming up heads, we no longer, you know, we thought this had a 99% chance of being true, but it explains the data pretty poorly. It's still possible, right? You know, being a 50% chance of 10 tosses in a row, that happens one in a thousand times, right? But we were only 99% sure that it was even going to be that case. And 1%, one out of a hundred times, we thought it could have been some rigged coin. And it turned out the rigged coin explains the data quite well. And so now we're seeing that, okay, that 1% is much more likely. And here's the shape of it with 10. But, you know, that 99%, I haven't given up on it yet. And if it's true, you know, it's, very, it's, less, it's less likely, but it's there. Right. And that's what we're seeing is slowly the idea starts, the, the alternative starts winning out. With only five tosses, it's not enough to throw it out because we came in with 99% chance and we're, we're still pretty sure of it. I have a little bit of doubt. Right. The 1% is gaining, gaining on it. Now, what's interesting though is with 10 here, let me show you this. This is actually kind of neat. What if we knock this down to the 100? Um, you can see it has a little bit more odds in it than the 1,000 did. Because the 100, when we said, okay, yeah, if it's a fair coin, there's a little bit more wider range of what it could be, right? We're a little bit less sure of it ahead of time. Well, then because of that, it explains the data a little bit better. So you still give us some odds of being true. It's kind of interesting. It's a little bit more flexible. And can say, okay, well, maybe it just happened to be, rather than just being for sure a 50% coin, 50-50, Maybe with this wider one, maybe it's just a 60% coin, 
right? You know, that's perfectly in line with it. And with a 60% coin, well, you can get 10 in a row. That's a little bit more likely. So it doesn't quite get, so you can see that this little hump right here is much higher than the one that was much more certain and was less flexible. And that one, you start to say, okay, I'm pretty sure it's the 1% chance here. All this one, you're still, you still think it's a 1%, the, the 1% chance, but it's not quite as sure as you were in the other case, where it was much more precise in its predictions and 99%. So anyway, this is a fun way to show you how priors end up giving you some pretty neat things after the fact. All right. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to leave it here. And then next, what we'll talk about is how do you actually summarize these things when you're communicating with other people? All right. And that'll be fun. So I'll see you then.